Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have come from Russia only 30 hours ago, a trip that left me in the former Soviet Union in a remote republic that was filled with very unusual conditions. It is that that I arrived in Aruba to find the team of TEDx Aruba greeting me at the airport. It was like I was going to have rest, but that is not what happened. They took me to the hotel and basically reiterated the treatment that people had in the Soviet Union because they told me in one hour you have to come to rehearsals. <laughs> I was already sleeping for not 36 hours and I stayed here last night for about 12 hours, I believe, and I left at midnight and went home, got up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and because of that, I forgot what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Fortunately, I have photographs, but I need the clicker. <laughs> the name is important also because I understand that I am coming after a astronaut, Edward. I'm coming after a commandant, I wanted to be a cosmonaut, but instead, Glenn coined a new term for me, the agronaut. <laughs> so here I am tonight to speak about plants. Fortunately, I have photographs. And the photographs will allow me very quickly to show you something that brings us all together. One of the continuous issues tonight has to be about community, connectivity, the synergies among people. Wherever I have been on this planet, I understand that we have the essential same needs. We need to have water. We need to have food, shelter. Traditions are all different. If you look at this photograph, beautiful me, but look in the back, you see different cultures, different traditions. This is in the area of Georgia, the former Republic of Georgia, known as the Svaneti. This is the home of the Svan people. The Svan people are incredible. They live in a beautiful land, mountains and valleys. And unlike many people of the world living today in modern places, they take care of themselves. They make their own food, they have their own cows, they have horses, they have gardens. They know where their food comes from and there's vast sources. This lady, a babushka, has beautiful fruit even in her little kitchen ready to eat. If you go to their pantries filled with food and they know where it came from. Beautiful fruit and gorgeous preserves. How many of you know about this? Beautiful melons all over the place. But unfortunately, their culture is not here in Aruba because, sorry, that is not your experience here in Aruba. And I'm not really Russian, but I did come from Russia. And it was a terrible trip. What we really want to know here, ladies and gentlemen, I've done this a few times, and now I'm starting to remember what I'm going to talk about. So here in Aruba, you have a very difficult situation, the result of modernity, the result of becoming so detached from where your food comes from that unless you go to the grocery store, this is an Andy Warhol, which was in the Museum of Modern Art in New York, you don't know how to get food. What if you had to go out in nature? How about raiding the national park to look for some berries or some edibles? How many of you would be able to do it? How many of you know about the Mari Pampoon or the agaves that your ancestors or the people who preceded you used to eat? The fact is we are so detached from our food that other people are the source of what we eat and we trust them. Now I'm an American if you can't tell by my real accent and unfortunately we have caused a lot of problem for the world because we are very efficient at one thing. We are efficient at business. And this perversion of reality in comparison to those bucolic villages of Georgia is that we have essentially been dictated by others how we eat and what we eat. 
I was in a hotel at a conference in Missouri that was called the Missouri Organic Conference. And they had not preemptively cleaned the shelves of what was offered in our hotel. So I went down and I had Butterfingers and Heath bars because that is all that was on offer. It's not that dismal when it comes to food, but the reality is big corporations basically produce the food that we eat and tell us what we must eat. And hence there is also because of that, a perversion of what we understand the future of food to be. Because this lady, Nina Fedorov, is one of our great spokespersons in the United States about the future of food. You may not have heard about her, but she happens to be the person who is responsible for promoting genetically modified organisms. And why and how does she purport that that is necessary? Because she will sit on a stage like this in front of a great number of reporters and influential media people, and she will say almost tear-jerkingly, the only way we're going to feed a hungry world is if we have genetically modified plants. She cites things like climate change. She cites things like ever-increasing drought, higher temperatures. And guess what? People believe her. The big problem about life is that we have somehow become myopic in our specializations, so much so that they may see the tree, but they don't see the forest. What I've done in my work as a botanical explorer is step back a few feet and ask myself, what is more important, to know everything about one or two things or to know a lot about a lot of things? And so I've become, by necessity, a generalist. And how that will unplay for you becomes important when we think of one of the world's greatest dilemmas. It's called the population dilemma. Nine billion people, they tell us, will have hungry mouths in 2050. How in the hell are we going to feed all these people? Well, the corporate byline is we have to continue to genetically manipulate corn so that it will grow in those hot, barren deserts. Or it will deal with huge amounts of salt high salinity, because after all, that's what happens when people irrigate in dry areas. The salt leaches up from the soil. Well, guess what? Mother Nature already has an answer. I cannot talk about the whole world in a few minutes, but I can talk about one place, and it happens to come right back to you here in Aruba, home. Because a lot of the world, like your home, is hot and dry. Let's think about this. Hot and dry places are not like the corn fields of Iowa. Hot and dry places are not like the coffee fields in Colombia. Hot and dry places are not, not like the swamps in Brazil. But yet, they cover some 10 to 15% of the world's surface. What I'm about to spin for you is a tale which will reveal why this tiny little island, prime minister to consider, is so pivotal in proving to the rest of the big, ignorant, confused world what the future of food is. Hotter, drier, windier, no problem. Nature already has solutions to this. There are thousands and thousands of species of plants. If you even have no consideration of history, you may reconcile what I'm telling you to just reality. Human beings are diverse. Among you, there's a palette of colors. Black, white, yellow, maybe even some purple people. The point is we've lived all over this globe and we've lived in various climatic situations. If I pull out of my repertoire of experience only the people who've lived in deserts of the world and then reduce that further to the hot, dry deserts of the world, we come up with similitude climates that parallel what Aruba has and vice versa. Now, if we think about it, people haven't been going and shopping and buying candy bars and Campbell soups their entire history. They used to forage. In fact, one of the fads in the United States is the paleo diet. What the hell is a paleo diet? It's where you're supposed to eat a big glob of meat and lots of vegetables. But the reality was that people were foragers and they relied upon what nature gave them. And relying on what nature gave them, they were able to have a huge diet and a huge variety of things to eat. And because of this, we can then consider the realities that nature offers us rather than the realities that our modern civilization has whittled down to a very paltry selection. How paltry is this selection? The bulk of humankind relies on 12 species of plants. That is for producing 85 to 90% of our world carbohydrate needs. 
pull some of them out. Rice, corn, beans, oats. These are the staple foods of the planet and we rely upon them excessively. What if we were to broaden our horizons? What if we went back to nature and we studied what people in the past used to eat? Well, there are all kinds of discussions about this. And one of the biggest discussions is somewhat like this. All the good things must already be domesticated. Now, when I say domesticated, I mean in a fashion that we can tend them and we can grow them and we can produce them, kind of crop them. But the reality is that these things fell by the wayside, not necessarily because of their unusefulness, but rather because they were just left behind in the rat race. Think of North America, that big, huge, wonderful continent. When the invaders came, in this sense, I'm talking about the people from the West, they were to displace the indigenous people, the native North Americans. Each of those North American tribes had their own food traditions, and those food traditions were precious. But when you uprooted people, you took, for example, the Iroquois Indians and you pushed them to Oklahoma from, from the eastern Atlantic seaboard and pushed them to Oklahoma, guess what happens? A complete annihilation of their food traditions. As they did this, they literally wiped out thousands of years of knowledge. And in that thousands of years of knowledge and the ignorance which preceded or succeeded, we end up obliterating a food history. I am now fun founding an organization called the North American Food Plant Renaissance as one of my endeavors. And this next spring in 2016, we will hold in Arizona something which is known as the first conference of its type for American, North American natives. And we will start to rehash and rediscover what their ancestors ate. How large is the selection? Some 3,000 to 4,000 species of plants that they ate that are now ignored. And the significance of this is extraordinary. In this photograph, I'm in another part of the world. I'm in Southern Africa in the state country of Namibia. So that plant you see there is very peculiar because it produces melons, but it has no leaves and it's growing on a sand dune, a very dry, a very desolate place. All over the world, there are so many amazing things. We talk about the looming populations, large deserts, and we wanna know how to feed a hungry world. And so I'm gonna bring you to my suggestions. Happily, there's a lot more to eat than just beans and rice because I've already started to unfold what that detail entails. Plants that people used all over the planet that are not cultivated. You just have to think of this. You are all, and I take the risk of saying this, ignorant of the possibilities because that is how it's happened. You probably don't know what that weird tubercle coated thing is in my hands. That is called a Gemsbach cucumber. It grows in the Kalahari Desert. This right here is what I call the Bedouin Buffet. I harvested all of these edible things growing in the arid and torrid deserts of the country of Oman in the Arabian Peninsula. And I ate every single one of them, except that large melon-like thing on the far left. This right here is in Madagascar. It took me three days on a torturous road. Actually, you couldn't really call it a road. You could call it a pothole trail. It led me to this village and I was in pursuit of this tuber because it grows in a very hot, dry condition, much like Aruba. This root is almost unknown. A chef in Holland, who I took that to, said it was the most extraordinary thing he ever worked with because it not only had a subtlety and a crunchiness of its own, but it absorbed the flavors that he would enhance it with in his dishes. A perfect and marvelous food, all but unknown. If it wasn't for this wonderful Malagasy, who took me to this remote area and pounded on the ground with a stick, I probably would have never found them because the vegetation that was associated with the plant had dried up in the dry season, much like your dry season dries up things here. Similitude climates, similitude examples for food for the world. So we have to examine and look and search for forgotten marvels. How many are there? Well, if I were to speak frankly, there are tens of thousands of edible plants because I distill that because there's something like 300,000 species of plants on the planet. If only 10% are edible, I come up with 30,000 species of edible plants. It turns out that the number of plants that we have as potential domesticates far exceeds the needs of humanity and places us in amazing position to recreate the future. So my source of inspiration is not innovation. Unlike almost everyone you've listened to in this talk, I'm the last one. 
It turns out that I am a pure, simple, pathetic copycat going back and looking what other people have done. I'm the last one, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> As it turns out, I'm a retrovader going back and discovering, but what I want to inspire you with tonight in this connectivity for the whole talk in the session of TEDx is that there are immense and extraordinary potentials for the future. So now I'm gonna pull the Aruban card because this is what this talk is about, about Aruba. How can a simple little country island do something for the world? It can do it by inspiration. The great minds that you've listened to tonight, apart from my own, are inspiring because they know how to make things work. I mean, Dagmara, the girl who helped organize this event, was amazing me so much and I asked her to be a part of my team. And why? Because it takes logistics, it takes details, it takes a way of organizing. Aruba, I claim, is extraordinarily poised to lead the world in tropical food security development, tropical desert food security development. I have amassed one of the largest personal collections of edible plant germplasm. Let me define that term. Germplasm is anything you use to reproduce a plant. It may be a tuber, it may be a root, it may be a stem, it may be a cutting, and it likely is seed. And so with that, I have the resources to literally create a Garden of Eden. I've tried to convince countries around the world of the efficacy of this, and I've distilled my pursuit to small, countries that have a minimum of bureaucracy, don't laugh, and that have the ability to make things happen quicker than, say, China with a billion point two hundred million people. All of these photos are just to give you a possible perspective. Trees that grow in dry desert areas, exactly like Aruba, where there's no rain for eight months a year, that pr produce huge papaya-like fruits. They're relatives of papayas. The dragon fruit, which so many of you are very familiar with, and then me sitting there in glee, pulling up this kind of root in the Kalahari Desert that grows on a cucumber vine but produces a large white carrot root that is tender, succulent, and juicy. This right here is a type of pine tree that grows in a remote area of Zacatecas, Mexico, but produces the largest pinion pine in the world. It would thrive in Aruba. These are other plants, whether it's in the, the Atacama Desert in the lower right, the melons which are coming from the Kalahari, or the hudia plant which I and my daughter are poising next to, that tuber which I already talked about. And so I want to share this with Aruba. And it is something that is possible and could be amazing. You have the Santa Rosa Agricultural Station. Three years ago I was invited here by then Minister of Health Richard Visser because he wanted to discuss the healthy diet aspect of good healthy living. And that introduced me to the Santa Rosa Agricultural Station, which I see as a preeminent potential for the development of this organization. I don't have a vested interest for myself because I'm insignificant. As I look at all the people in the world, we're all insignificant as individuals, but essentially we can change the world. I propose to you the Aruban movers and shakers. Who else would come to a TED Talk? a model farm that is based on my world food plant research. And with your invitation, I am willing to make Aruba my adopted home for that purpose. I can't live anywhere. I can't live anywhere all the time just by the nature of my life, but I have fallen in love with this little island for ways that I can't really describe. It's not because the beaches or the resorts. It's because I have been so welcomed here on the occasions that I've been here. And I feel the same with you tonight. So food security is everyone's business, especially people who depend on others for it. And that's you. You get 90 plus percent of your food from foreigners. I mean, come on, what if the boats didn't come here? What would you do? <laughs> what if the planes didn't come here? That is not food security. You are vulnerable despite your confidence that the system's gonna work. It shows us that at times it doesn't. New York City had a blackout a couple of years ago. People were not starving, but they were damn hungry because the refrigerators broke down, the, the stores were raided, there was no food. Think about that. Now I claim that Aruba is hot, dry, and sophisticated, and what happens in Aruba, no, that doesn't stay in Aruba, what happens in Aruba about food will interest the whole world. I think that's the end of it, and there's my website to show you a little bit more about the work I do and maybe my bizarre life. 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.